Welcome to Profiles in Eccentricity, a show about weirdos, with your hosts, John Fahey, Aaron Peter, and Matt Brutzow. Hello folks, welcome to Profiles in Eccentricity, it's a doggone show about weirdos. My name is John Fahey. Sitting across from me, not a prettier man under the sun, unrelenting beauty, say hello to Mr. Aaron Joseph Pita. Hi, everybody. Can you feel how pretty I am? God damn it, you're radiant. I feel good. You don't want to know why? I'm wearing my shirt. I'm yeah. wearing my Profiles in Eccentricity Ooh, shirt. baby. Yeah, dude. You're wearing your Profiles in Eccentricity shirt. I'm wearing my shirt. I Freak at the Teak. Mm-hmm. You are. You? And Matt, the guy over to my right, your mm-hmm. left. Mm-hmm. Wearing the cocaine bear shirt. Provided by Stephen Parks. Super mm-hmm. fan. Our friend. Causes hot confusion depending where I am. Oh, what yes, yes, yes. And our guest, one of my favorite comedians mm-hmm. in Los Angeles, mm-hmm. not a prettier woman on earth, Miss Laura Crawford, everybody. <laughs> Hi. Hi, Vince. It's Laura Crawford. Okay. That's not how you're going to talk. That's her catchphrase. It's Laura Crawford. That's how, That's she how I say herself. my name usually on stage, and I point at myself with a big thumb. <laughs> big old thumb in my chest. Kukunk, kukunk, kukunk. Matt, uh, my friend Michelle back home after your uh, Blow Came Baseball episode. Oh, yes. She said to me, she's like, I could listen to Matt talk forever about anything. What? She's like, he could be talking about shit. Reading and and I was like, I was like, a lot of times he is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh. Like, do you know about this dude? Oof. Oof. Um, well, we're thanks, gonna, thanks, Michelle. We're gonna be getting into a little bit of of, uh, of wrestling nonsense, mm. but I have got the most uh, profilesy thing in the world, um, provided by my friend, uh, longtime friend, Mister Chris Donaldson. He sent it to me today. He's like, there's not a news article that is more uh, like about your show than this. Um, Wait, is this the one you talked to me about? I don't think so. Uh, I just got okay. this today. Oh no! Then this not. is from three years ago. Do you know? Uh, you know uh, the sheriff Joe Arpaio? Yes. Uh, oh, yeah. You know uh, by Arizona. Uh, yes. Um, great, aside, great patriot and humanitarian. <laughs> oh, yeah. awful, awful man. Yes. But uh, aside from his, um, you know, racist uh, haranguing of uh, you know <laughs> yes. uh, of people, is uh, he was very gung ho about attacking uh, people into bestiality. Oh, you know about that. He was no. against, he was he was against bestiality. Well, was, I, I think what John is, what usually happens in this situation is he's pro bestiality. He's just trying to not do it himself. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. Well, he wants to. He's uh, he's he's very much highlighting um, uh, the bestiality, and he was he got a bunch of convictions of people that were like um, animal fuckers in Arizona. Yeah, yeah, yeah. People that were like. Um, uh, Somebody put, somebody put a somebody put a somebody put a Craigslist ad that was oh. the, the listing the like the link that you clicked on was wife for canine oh wife oh. four number wife, four wife why for are women canine. always with dogs I've never understood that I've watched a lot of animal fucker documentaries and the I guys did. are always horses women always dogs don't what? know what it is right uh, the dogs yeah. are good at oral anytime I see like a girl <laughs> walking with like a giant tongue. Great Dane or something I'm always like yeah that's yeah just yeah such a dog. yeah. <laughs> And he always a big says German it to me. shepherd. Whenever we're Lops around, there's a girl so. with a dog. Aaron always goes, "She fucks her dog." <laughs> yeah, Saint yeah, Bernard. You can just tell. Get that big wet. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think you big, can Big soft tell. wet I, tongue I don't all think over you. Can you. Can no, tell. it's not a tongue. Oh. It's their penis. No, but, it's the tongue. It so, is. Uh, see, spoken like a fucking. The wife for canine. That's why those women like them. The wife for canine uh, couple. They got caught in a sting operation. Uh, guy was like, "I got a dog." He didn't have a dog. He had a bunch of cops. You know what I mean? Oh, oh canine. Oh. And they showed up. It was. The couple uh, with the wife that wanted to get done by the dog, and then just some other fellow that wanted to watch. Aww. Well, you know, go ahead. You know, <laughs> was it Chris Hansen? <laughs> <laughs> but in another uh, very uh, NBC styled sting, Ooh. they they would do this shit in uh, in Arizona for the bestiality stings. There was like a to catch a bestiality or yeah. and uh, one of this one of these guys. Why was, am I sympathetic? Was um, <laughs> this guy? <laughs> This guy said he, quote, flew cross country uh-huh. to relax in a long soak of tiny horse piss. <laughs> <laughs> you just wanted to soak in it? Tiny horse piss. Oh, my God. Oh, like a Shetland. Miniature, miniature oh horses. Yes. A Shetland pony. And so, so he comes across the country. He's a very old man from Pennsylvania. He comes... He, 
<laughs> like, you're not even policing Arizona. You're policing this fucking weirdo. And it's just pissed. And, yeah, uh, it's just they, pissed. And they have, they have the screenshot really of the um, the online conversation. He is horse love horse lover 47. L- so there are 46 other horses. L-U-V-R. <laughs> Of course, you can fit and, it with And the... maybe he's born in 47 because he's, o- oh, he's an old yeah, ass yeah. man. Yeah. Yes. And his. World War II kids. His. It's quote, horse lover. His quote <laughs> on the screen is. His quote on the screen is Are you really a horse? <laughs> <laughs> oh, is this Mr. Ed oh typing to me? Oh, my God. It's bigger than both so of us. So he, 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 thinks, he thinks he's talking to a horse. <laughs> and what? And the decoy goes, An of course. Horse? Yeah. It goes, of course. <laughs> Y-A, yeah. The quote is R, A-R-E, that's fine. U, the letter U, R-L-Y, a horse. Are you really a horse? Y- yay or nay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, my gosh. So he, so he flies. Snort uh, one for you. He Snort flies across the country. He's talking to these fucking Maricopa County sheriffs oh, or whatever Maricopa. Yeah. that are, are are trying to line up these bestiality stings because this guy, Arpeo, Ar- Ar- is a psycho. <laughs> uh, well, what the fuck does he care about some guy? <laughs> he with, cares uh, about these well, assholes of innocent animals. That wants because ti- all, he, he doesn't want anybody else soaking up all mm-hmm. that good tiny horse piss. <laughs> so this old man flies across country oh. with... With five shirts that he's that he wants these two miniature ponies to piss all over <laughs> just so he can wear them. Wait, why is this illegal? <laughs> that's what he said when he got arrested. Yeah, why is that's this illegal? It shouldn't be illegal. No. Just no. And that was his quote. He's like, I don't know why I'm getting arrested. He's like, yeah. there was nothing sexual or whatever. But they said the, de- nothing the deputy... It didn't violate the horses whatsoever. The deputies were like, he, he admitted in the conversation he had a long history of fucking animals. So what? But still... Circumstantial so at best. Right, right. <laughs> This, this That's fucking, ridiculous. This show is you on can, the side of the you pervert. Can, you can, I am. I'm firmly can, on the side I of this pervert. I saw two girls drink donkey jizz and piss on Fear Factor. Mm, if, that's you, true. If you can't let a guy soak his shirt in some good old-fashioned horse urine, Tiny I'm sorry. Horse. I thought this was America. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right, but so I mean, thank you, eat, so he could thank have you. he could have <laughs> killed that horse and eaten its meat. No problem. Right. But not because as he cross was... country to relax in a long soak mm. of tiny horse piss. Does that not just make you think of those old, you know, in those movies when they show like those couples jacuzzis and stuff that are like heart shaped? Yeah, <laughs> it makes me think mm. of him in a heart shaped jacuzzi full of tiny horse. But piss. not, but not before like uh, an Indiana Jones map with a uh, a plane <laughs> flying yes, over it with yes. the dotted lines. Well, I imagine it's into like, a, a heart shaped. The map's on of fire. Fit. The map's on fire because he's like burning a yeah, path. You can't get. You can't get. To, the, fast to, to Arizona, but like they got to be tiny horses for some reason. Oh, they have different it's piss. Cute. It's cute. Why he's like I don't want, I'm not a weirdo. I don't want any of that big horse that piss. Clydesdale piss. No yeah. way. No, and yeah. then what's he gonna do? Get the five shirts and then bring them home? No, 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 no. no you, you, you don't wear bring each them shirt home, in a different pool of piss. Yeah. Huh? You yeah. keep you. Uh, you probably maybe you freeze them. <gasps> So then you can defrost them and have the frothy piss on you later. Like you know how they smuggle like drugs sometimes, or they'll soak a carpet in it and yeah, then yeah, or put yeah. it in a That's bag and then thinking. another right. bag and uh, mustard and, and then, then right vacuum yeah. yeah. seal it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. But people on the plane are like, it smells like piss. It smells like the tiniest <laughs> horse's piss on this plane. Yeah, it smells like the most baby infant horse. Uh, piss. Sir, your bag oh. is leaking. Doesn't that defeat the whole purpose of the? Sorry, huge no horse beer for cock? me. I'm straight edge. Just tiny horse piss <laughs> and little kids butts. <laughs> There's oh a t-shirt. God. Yes, I want pop chips. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, yeah, just make a popsicles out of it. <gasps> yeah. Mm. So so, you can rub them all over your face later. He had um, he had eight bestiality arrests in, in five years. Come on. Arpeo? Yeah, he was super gung-ho about that. Uh, oh, I thought you meant the tiny horse guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, 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 no. This guy. So, our, like, did our... Because all of these things, like usually, that comes down from on high, like we need to we need to clear these numbers. Yeah. Like our pale is like we haven't <laughs> hit our, <laughs> we haven't hit our score. Score. yeah. How come nobody's talking about dudes that want their shirts covered in tiny horse piss? <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're talking about it. Yeah, yeah. Why, talking, is, why is nobody talking about? Wait, I wish we could. Is there a legal defense fund we can contribute for this? Yeah, guy? what's the guy's name? Can I we look like him the, up? I was there like a the piss people, starter? I feel like there's like to be a yeah, a, a Kickstarter, a, a piss starter. starter. I feel like the fans of this show should donate this guy money to fight his to fight well, his legal case. Horse lover forty seven. <laughs> yes. Sign up to the Patreon. We'll yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. If we'll, you want to make a special donation, we'll forward him the money, dude. Like. 
What? Can you imagine the judge being like, huh? So what did you do? <laughs> And I, I just don't make me think about the judge is like, that's illegal? So good time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now, y'all, <laughs> my defendant is just a good old fashioned red blooded American. And I don't know what he wanted to do. If he's only just guilty of flying across state lines, exchanging American currency for just a. A few gallons of warm, tiny horse piss. <laughs> nah, nah, nah. Soaked in his nah, shirts. Hey, yeah. If that ain't illegal in my yeah. country, well, I guess I better uh, just turn in my keys. 10,000 letters addressed to Santa Claus, all wanting horse piss. Tiny, tiny horse Exhibit piss. Exhibit A, y'all. <laughs> and, like, and, like, I mean, can you imagine how much time it took this maniac to develop this fetish? Mm. Probably one bad day. Probably one day. <laughs> tiny <laughs> horses... Pissing on his clothes. Here's what I imagine. Specific childhood. Uh, what is it called? The guy who puts the sh- the shoes on horses. It's a specific blacksmith. Horse. Yes. Blacksmith. Yeah, there's a blacksmith, but there's another. One. So he's uh, he's furnishing horses with these shoes. He's furnishing. He's them, putting yeah. on the shoes, and then one day this tiny horse accidentally pisses in his face, and he's like, "Oh, oh my god!" Wow, and he's yeah. Horrified mm. at first, and then yeah. he looks at himself in the mirror, and a drop just dribbles down to the tip of his tongue. And he goes, "That's the most delicious." Jesus Christ. Yeah. So that it's is, a massive, movies, massive though. erection. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah. yeah. You don't want to have an erection as a blacksmith. That's very dangerous. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You might hit. There's an anvil. There's yeah, an anvil. you might There's chew an it. There's fire. <laughs> There's fire. <laughs> you might chew it. I, I don't want. My penis. I think you don't. I remember watching this special once about a guy who had a fetish for fire, and he was talking about lighting himself on so fire. <laughs> he was talking about covering himself and like lighting himself on fire, and like having a huge erection and climax, like right before he would have to put himself out and like wow. roll around <laughs> and stuff like that. And he, like he would just love. To, he would just come from being doused in fire. Being Did you hear in, in the one episode? <laughs> Where we talked about spontaneous human combustion. Yes. Those dudes waking up in the middle of the night on fire. Yeah. <gasps> that dude would just that guy, nut. Yeah, that guy would nut all so, over himself. It's a himself. wet dream. This is a, yeah, it's yeah. a hot... It's not, <laughs> a, wet, it's not we, a wet dream. We got, we got, we got burning sent a... burning cinder of a dream. We got sent a picture of a, like, a, one of the bodies at Pompeii they found. Yeah. And and the, dude, oh, yeah, the guy, the great masturbator. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. That, oh, yeah that's what it's called? It's called the great masturbator? It's something like that's that. That's what I call I think it. the name of it. Oh, when I do it. But I have seen that before, and yeah, there's a name of it. And I bet that guy thought... Do you think he's seen a lot on ancient Rome? Load, I've like, seen oh a- my god! <laughs> so, I finally did it! My question about that is that guy masturbating yeah. with the volcano. Yeah. Was it he- sounds like he's putting his dick into a volcano. No, 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 but like, was he masturbating or was he like one for the road? Right, right. Before it gets oh, me. Fuck it. Hear it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here it mm. comes, and so do I. Yeah. Oh. But it's great because you see his like charred ass corpse and he's uh, he's got one leg kicked he's out. I was like, I was like, I got the style, dude. I get it. Yeah. I've been there. Yeah. I've been there, you kicked that one leg out. I think um I think well either way we we do know that he didn't finish. Ah. Uh, yeah, presumably. Which is sad. Which is sad. Wait, because he would have made it out? Well, he wouldn't be like still stroking it. Like yeah, that, yeah, yeah. You know? uh, right. Uh, Unless he timed it. Perfect. It's a lot. Of, a lot of it's Bro. about timing. Yeah, yeah. Right. It's all timing. <laughs> it really. My is. question: Why don't we throw our trash in volcanoes? I know. That's a great question, Aaron. Yeah. I just thought about that today. Right. <laughs> <laughs> why don't yeah. we throw our trash in your mouth? <laughs> yeah, it, it keep from spitting up all the time. Yeah, just yeah. plug it up with trash. Yeah. yeah, we've tried the ocean. We haven't tried volcanoes. Yeah, well, you know, we should. Just think about it. Yeah, all right. Should. Yeah. All keep, right, all uh, those, keep all those mole people in check. Yeah. Yeah. Try not to nut while you're doing it. <laughs> the listeners, join our Patreon and leave us a comment about why we shouldn't do that. Yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah. Or shut your goddamn mouth. <laughs> all right, so... Um, not you, Matt. Of course. Uh, oh, gosh. My brother, my brother Laura has been really looking forward to this. Your episode. brother Laura, <laughs> yeah, hold on. My, brother. my brother has been really looking forward to this episode. Uh, he's you told he's, him about it. I, he's very very psyched about it. This will probably be the first episode of the podcast my brother ever listens to. So oh, listening, oh, I love oh, you, Rory. Rory. Thank you for listening, Rory. Uh, yeah, his name's Rory. Good Irish mm. boy. Yes. Good Rory. Yes. Rory. So you were going to tell us about Sputnik Monroe. Yeah. So I was uh, going to talk about Sputnik Monroe. He is the Diamond Rain and Cadillac Man. The Diamond Ring? The Diamond Ring and Cadillac Man, Sputnik Monroe. He's 235 pounds of twisted steel and sex appeal That, with a body that women loved and men feared. He's going to eat you up like boarding house pie and put something on you that Ajax won't take off, and that's stronger than dirt. 
Oh. Ah, oh. I like that. A lot, yes. yeah. a lot of claims there. A lot of claims there. So basically, a lot of braggadocio. Sputnik Monroe is a professional wrestling figure, and he represents some uh, one of the biggest cultural icons of Memphis wrestling, and most well known for being a hero of the civil rights movement. You say unknown is hero. You say is. Yeah. Is he currently a wrestler and is no, currently two hundred thirty no, no. pounds? No, He passed away. His heyday was the late fifties. He mm. passed away in two thousand. Six. Hmm. So he's mostly got well known and reintroduced to people kind of recently. He's talked about Jim Cornette, who's a great wrestling manager, who you know, also from Smoky Mountain Wrestling and WWE. He recently talked about him with Steve Austin on his podcast, and people sort of became aware of him again. Stone Cold Steve Austin. Stone Cold Steve Austin, <laughs> yep. Just Broken did. Skull Ranch. Uh, so he was, he's most well known for pop- popularizing, integrating, he integrated sports in the South probably his greatest claim to fame is that he is a single white individual completely integrated sports in the south which is sort of an amazing claim and something that you don't really think about or know about or anything like that it's a white guy it's a white man yeah you see this picture of this guy and he's 235 pounds like he says it had his height he's huge dude and a mean looking villainous looking guy who you can't believe we would be responsible for anything good. He looks like a proto he looks like an early punk like a prototype of an early punk figure in the late 50s mm. So basically this guy who was born in 1928 in Dodge City, Kansas, and uh, his dad died in a uh, plane wreck a month before he was born. Flying to go <laughs> Yeah, some, so uh, he... horse piss. <laughs> <laughs> Flying across country to Arizona to go drink a big thing of horse piss. So like he never met his father at all. And uh, it's this weird thing with a lot of celebrities and actors you read about is like they often have a parent that dies early in their life or they have their parents divorce early sort of a mark of greatness so weirdly so he's raised by his grandparents in dodge city kansas mostly like he doesn't really even see his mother much and he always says that when he was a kid he absorbed a lot of his mother's pain from having lost her husband in this really dramatic way and then him having died and the funny thing about dodge city kansas is it's weird that kansas figures so heavily in the, the civil rights movement in terms of like the Civil War and story in the Civil War, remember bleeding Kansas was the thing. Mm-hmm. It was the question of whether Kansas is going to be a slave state or not. Mm-hmm. Drove a lot of the action of the Civil War. But so he grows up in Dodge City, which of course you know if you ever watch westerns and stuff like that, it's like Dodge City is like the bad place it's where the bad place you men get the come fuck from. Out of. Yeah, you get the fuck out of Dodge, right? Mm-hmm. And it was a lawless place, and it's kind of funny because I didn't realize this, but the, the, so the cattle trade goes through Dodge City, Kansas, and that's one of the things. So you drive up cattle from Texas, and they go to all the big meat markets in Chicago and. Uh, um, Chicago. Chicago. Well, they all like good chili. <laughs> New York City. Um, I don't know. I was thinking that. Pie salsa. And so all the, the cattle go through there. So Dodge City at one point was so big as a city, it even had a bullfighting ring. Mm. Which like, I know, like functioning mo- all the time, huh. like a modern bullfighting. And like that used to be a show that they would have like five days a week in the late 1800s in Kansas. Like, uh, like Spanish Mexican yes, like style? Yes, Spanish Mexican style. So they would bring up matadors. bullfighters. They bring up matadors from Mexico and have them fight in Kansas City. Huh. And uh, wow. Dodge City, Kansas, and all those cities are just hilarious. So he grows up there. And the weird thing about wrestling at that time is. Uh, Wrestling for until like I guess like the eighties or the seventies, it was all like dads teaching their sons because it's a closed society, mm-hmm. which makes total sense because yeah. it is you're relying on people to keep the secret mm-hmm. that it's staged, right? And it's you're like all, magic. Yeah, it's mm-hmm. like magic. Yes, it's very well kept secrets, and you also have to trust people with your body. It's another thing too. It's like, like the people kind of don't think about it. It's like you have to trust people not to fucking kill you or right, drop you on your right, neck or drop right. you on your head or whatever so it's largely fathers passing their knowledge to sons or whatever so so he's born roscoe monroe merrick even though it, like other people say he had this other last name they'd be like oh his name was the shrizio or whatever to crizio or something but it was merrick was his real name mm. his name was roscoe and uh, so he got his start he couldn't do the dad thing at all because he's a bastard and he's a bastard <laughs> he's a bastard and uh, so he gets in through carnivals, which is like the other way that you could come mm. into wrestling mm. in the oh, 40s. For bastards. Yeah, because at the time in carnivals, so wrestling was sort of like a carnival show in that it was like a, 
you know, a Carl. Yeah, the girl. strong man and the bearded lady and. Well, that's more like a freak show. <laughs> but but it was still the uh, Yeah, but this is like circus maybe. Yeah, it's like a stage act. So okay. it's kind of like how you know when you throw the baseball at the milk bottles, but they're all like glued together. You don't yeah, know. Right. So they would be like, we're gonna have a wrestling show, and this wrestler he'll take on all comers, so anyone can challenge him and he'll beat him. Mm-hmm. And oftentimes they would have a stage dude, you know, in the mm-hmm. audience and say, I'll wrestle him, and they they know each other, so they have it worked out, so they know what the finish is going to be. But you would also be that you would occasionally do take on all comers. You would really do wrestling fight the moves. public. You would really fight the public. Wow. The Hell only yeah. like the only kind of safety you had was that you knew grappling moves. You were a hooker, which is you would hook guys by the ankle or by the wrist or something. You would know how to do these like moves to like take them out. Basically jujitsu. Right. Kind of like right. take away their power kind right. of thing. Yeah, yeah. So you'd like blindside the guy by like knocking him down at the knees or mm-hmm. like hooking his ankle or something and you pin him really quickly. <laughs> I'm sure they had to sign pages and pages of waivers. Before. Of course. Oh, yeah, yeah. It was the 40s. But lots of legalese. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Right, right. They were killing Japs and put them in camps and wrestling people. <laughs> and the legalese. Don't even get started on what they did to the legalese. Yeah, the Chinese, the legalese, the Vietnamese. <laughs> Laotians. They always seem like a weird outlier. But uh, so he got his start that way. So he went to a carnival as a young man and saw them doing this. And he's like, I want to do this. And so he contacted this guy, Jack Nasworthy, who started training him. It was really hard to get trained. So he had to be taught, like, brought in really slowly, taught all these secrets and everything and learn so how he, to do yeah, life on the road. He kept, like, showing up, knocking on the trailer. Yeah, yeah. And he's like, get out of here, kid. <laughs> but that's part, of, that's part here. of the training. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right. You know, will you knock on the door? I, yeah, time? Batman Begins. Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Doctor Strange. Yeah. Every story ever. Yeah, you, right. yeah. It's the hero's journey. So he starts doing that, and it's really, you know, it it's hard to kind of make a living doing that because you're out on the road and you know you don't have any fame or anything like that. And he really gets, he's like a tough wrestler. He's not like a really good guy. He's not like a good. He's not like Bret Hart. He can't like do a lot of moves in the ring. How old is he at this point? He's in his twenties. So he's already in his twenties. Okay. Yeah, because he's born in nineteen twenty-eight, and then so like forty-five, he starts wrestling. Nineteen forty-five. Why, why he is he not uh, in the war? He never signed up for the war. It's forty-five. He's kind of like he's like. 18 or so. I don't know why he doesn't go to the war, but he doesn't go into the service. Yeah, probably because he's a coward. (laughs) Yeah, he was 235 pounds. He's just a fucking coward. (laughs) I don't know why he doesn't show up for service. I mean, he wants to fight the public, so I don't know. He's afraid of all the the great, the Japs and Hun bastards. He wants to fight the good old-fashioned Americans here on our soil. You gotta put on a show for the ladies and children left behind, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. stick it to them. In in about 45, you're 18, there's, there's, you know, about 4% of the population, uh, available population is being taken the time so the odds that he would be chosen are sure, really yeah. low but sure. he didn't sign up for i think he always kind of felt really like an outsider because he grew up he was you know didn't have a dad he lived with his grandparents and i think he always felt like he was from the wrong side of the track sort of thing and identified kind of with underdogs who didn't fit in with normal people he's done looking, looking for a calling yeah he was kind of always looking for a calling if only there and that's why sort he... of compulsory service where one could <laughs> Get training and, and find some sort find of an higher identity. purpose. Um, I guess I'll follow the circus around. Yeah, I'm gonna go join up with these carnivals who fucking rip people off. He seems to yeah, have like he's got a beard. No, he definitely just seems to have like a disdain for normal people. It yeah. seems to be something that's like really running through him. And it's like yeah, it's uh, the best thing about like 40s and 50s wrestlers is the names, of course. Mm-hmm. Right. Because the women are all like Legs Gennaro, and the guys are all like <laughs> like, like Rocky. So his names were like. Elvis Rock Monroe. Like, he had the name Elvis that he worked under when Elvis was going. He was Pretty Boy Rock. Mm-hmm. Huh. Pretty Boy Rock. Which is a Carrie Hilson song, right? Pretty Boy Rock? No, it's Pretty Girl Rock, sorry. And then he was Rock Monroe. And this is like. But he wasn't pretty anymore, that he was just Rock. Yeah. Mm-hmm. He was just The Rock. <laughs> he was The Rock? Uh-huh. Yeah, and he was Hulk. He went by, like, Hulk and all this stuff, oh, which that's is funny. Cool. Oh, like, yeah. yeah. So there's this huge tradition in wrestling with that. Because, like, you know, the, obviously there's The Rock, which everybody knows, but his mm, dad was. His dad was Rocky Johnson. Yeah. Right. And then uh, Terry Bollea, who became Hulk Hogan, his early name was Terry Boulder. Oh. I <laughs> love. It's right. the worst name. Most bad. Terry Boulder. Right. <laughs> Up next, uh-huh. Terry. Terry is just such a. Yeah, yeah. Terry's such a it's lame It's terrible. Ass name. But no matter what, you're a mountain. Terry. So. Yeah, so. A guy named really Terry has like a blonde page boy haircut, right? And it's well, like. Yeah. But she kind of. He did. <laughs> he did. Yeah, no, he had a soft hair of a silky Chinese man. So he just. <laughs> he So he starts getting into wrestling, and obviously it's, you know, hard to get in this, but he had so many things that he just had. He had ideas and ego about this whole thing. He said. He, 
win if you can, win if you can, lose if you must, always cheat. And if you have mm. to leave the ring, leave tearing it down. Wow. That's a great quote, which that is, is so win Trump. if you can, lose if you must, always cheat, always cheat. So the thing is, so he's a villain, and typically in these times, the villains were always expected to lose. That was always the thing that you were supposed to be laying down for the right. hero. Mm-hmm. And he was really an early villain that said, I don't want to do that. And yeah. it kind of laid a great tradition, or, or when he said that, I'm going to do everything I can to not lose, to not leave on my back, to not do that. And like Bruiser Brody was like that. He would often refuse to lose. Um, refuse to lose. Refuse to lose. But, you know, he was a guy who was like, I'm not going to lay down for anybody. I'm going to, you know, protect. it's called protecting. You know, you have to protect your character, protect your image. And then mm. later, you know, like Mick Foley would talk about that. He'd be like, why do I have to be like the bad guy just because I'm the villain? Like, I don't have to be stupid. I don't have to cheat. I can just be a bad man. Right. Who actually mm. could deserve to win. So the funny thing, so he has like Hitler. This, yeah, like Hitler. Why do I have to lose? Why? Because I'm a 90 pound Austrian with one testicle, no, but, but, vegetarian. Why do but, I have to lose? But really, with this thing of like, you know, like with you know the heels and stuff the in heels. wrestling, yeah, it's yeah, like, yeah, the heels. It's like I, I would, him. I would like find myself being like, well, this, I, this guy's just got a different opinion. <laughs> you yeah, know what I mean? Yeah. And I would end up being like, I like, I like this guy for some reason. He has mm-hmm. some charisma, and you would end up liking, like when Shawn yeah. Michaels was a heel and mm-hmm. stuff like that. You would be like. Yeah. Yeah, but he's charismatic and mm. like, like you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, you, you, when you, me and you always talk about this. Like, to you them, the you're guy. the bad guy. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm. Hulk Hogan's the bad guy to fucking Sergeant Slaughter or yeah. whatever. You know, like he's a sergeant. You know, like <laughs> yeah. fuck you. You know what yeah. I mean? Well, it's an, we from it's, the beach in Daytona. <laughs> the fuck it's just out like of an here. interesting change. In cu- to- <laughs> it's an interesting change in culture because that is really like a shift that we experience. I mean, if you ever read like uh, Easy Riders, Raging Bulls, and those kind of movies, they talk about right. that shift in film that happened in mm-hmm. cinema that people were more anti. Heroes rooting yes. for villains. The birth and stuff of the like anti hero, right? Yeah. That, uh, yeah. yeah, that makes total sense. Yeah, but I think in we... wrestling, they didn't do that at all until like the 90s. Right. But do you think back then, when it when was just Hulk spectator went, yeah. stuff, mm-hmm. do you think that there was a part of the audience that wanted the bad guy to win? There definitely was. And because of the persona that he crafted specifically as a bad guy because he had so many different aspects of his character that people could identify with as a bad guy like just his personal style like we talk about that he had that blonde plume in the front of his hair you see pictures he's got black hair black eyebrows but this blonde like pomp in the front right and what it rumored to be what happened was that he was facing an early opponent and the guy hit him on the back of the head with a wooden chair so the chair kind of exploded on impact and some of the spikes splinters went into his scalp and then they said that like when he they pecked them out he said the hairs that grew in there were white Wow. So what he decided mm-hmm. to do is just bleach the whole thing. Mm-hmm. Right. So he bleached that plume, and it just is such a cool punk look. And there, you know, Jim Cornette mentions this in one of his interviews that, like, around the late '50s, if you look still to this day, if you go back and look at uh, Memphis high school yearbooks, you see all these, which I do, all these senior, all these senior boys and junior boys in the graduating classes of '58, '59, they all would bleach their hair like that, no and shit. they would do it. And it was just a style thing that pervaded the culture around that time because they all had, you know, the duck bill haircut right. and all that stuff. Right. So was, he really became, you know, just like known for that. And he was super flamboyant. He wore like purple suits yeah. and felt hats and homburgs. Sorry. And all these like fancy hats. He had a, you know, he called himself the diamond, uh, diamond ring Cadillac man. That kind of started when he got to Memphis because it was a new territory. And he wanted to make a name for himself. So he had- Are you saying the diamond ring? The diamond, the diamond ring and Cadillac man. Got yeah. it, got so it, he got wore it. diamond rings. He had a cane that was diamond tipped. Love it. So like wow. a, you know, like it was a diamond trader or something, or like John uh, or the guy from Jurassic Park right. with the amber, amber mm-hmm. but diamonds. And he was very flashy and looked like a pimp. Like when they right. describe him, you're like, that's right. what a pimp looks right. like. Yeah, that guy's always the villain. Dude. Yeah, snakeskin yeah. shoes, and he just yeah. yeah. So he's super flamboyant, and then so he gets to. He gets to the South and everything, and the South obviously is completely segregated around this time. You know, completely segregated, which is funny because it's like doing research on this. When I was looking back on it, I was kind of looking at segregation laws, and the crazy thing about it is, it like, made a lot of sense. They really had it right. <laughs> no, uh, no, nothing like that. <laughs> yeah, they really had it right. No, so he had come from Kansas, which was obviously legally sort of integrated, but you know, socially segregated. And he goes mm-hmm. to the South, which is completely. Legally segregated, and which happened around the late 1800s after Reconstruction, you know, after the federal troops left the South, basically, they instituted Jim Crow and everything like that. And it was just 
That would have been a great wrestler name, too. Jim, Jim Crow. Jim Crow. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. He would have really yeah. kicked ass. <laughs> My God. Oof. But uh, so he just completely took... <laughs> I got a woof from Matt. Oof. Oof. <laughs> Oof. But he completely took... He kind of didn't give a fuck about these laws at the time. He just figured, I'm an American. I have these things going on for me. So the story of how he got the name Sputnik is really fun. And I love this story. So he's driving to do the show in Mississippi. And at this time, you know, you're driving around to do everything, and that's the only way to get around. So he's in Alabama, and he picks up a black hitchhiker, which is very unusual. You don't and he, really is he do dressed that. like a pimp as he picks yes. him up? Yes, he's dressed like a pimp, and he's got a Cadillac, and he pulls over, oh, and this black God. guy was, like, scared out of his mind. He's yeah. just got, like, a suitcase, and he's hitchhiking. So he goes, come on in. So he picks him up, <laughs> and he just... work? Yeah, so he picks him up, and he goes, can you drive? Because he's probably drunk. Yeah. He's probably alcohol involved mm-hmm. because, you know, also heavy drinking. So he picks him up and he goes, can you drive? And the guy's like, this white man is asking me to drive his Cadillac. Like, what the fuck? Yeah. So he goes, okay. And he goes, we got to go down to this TV station. He's like, we got to go to Channel 2. And he's like, so he's like, you have to drive me down because I got to go do this wrestling show at this TV station. Man, he sounds like a real progressive, bleeding heart liberal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hey, <laughs> black guy, drive me around. He's like, drive me. He's like, you got to get somewhere. I'll take you there. He dude gets behind the wheel. He's like, all right, we're going down to Channel 2. We're going to go to the TV station. We're going to film this thing. Then you and I afterwards, we can go out and go rock and roll. And we can get some ladies on the street. He said, ladies on the street. I don't know if that means just like chicks who are walking around. Hookers. Hookers. Yeah, yeah why not? Gonna, hey, we're hookers. We're going to get some dames. Mm-hmm. Going to get some whores. Whores. So he, so he gets this guy's car. It was Satchel Page. Yes, it was Satchel <laughs> Page. And he was like, I've got plenty. So they go down the TV studio, and this is so this is in uh, Mississippi. So he's got this, this black man who's driven him there. He's like, okay, come into the studio with me. And the guy's like, all right, I'll go in the studio with you. So he goes in, and then he keeps... They have, like, a curtain there that's dividing the stage. So he's bringing this black guy out and kissing him on the cheek. So he kisses him on the cheek, like, a bunch of times in front of people. Every time he does it, the crowd blows up because mm-hmm. people are incensed. Obviously, this is horrible. There's still laws against interracial marriage. There's, there's homosexuality. still... The, the homosexuality. No. It's hitting every they possible even, button. They can't even fathom. How do we, yeah. They're what, like, what, triple what, negative, what do I get angry? Yeah, exactly. yeah they, they can't even decide where to go first to be incensed. Yeah. Oh, the, TV, the TV's in black and white. <laughs> Society should be in black and white. <laughs> yeah. Struck me the mind. pimp is white <laughs> and the girl is a black dude. I don't know. <laughs> Understand. Who drove? <laughs> <laughs> they seem to be drunk together and in love. This is highly irregular. Can you imagine the look on the hitchhiker's face on TV when this, I'm gonna get just, killed. this dude is kissing him? Like, uh, I, 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 and I, this is how I die. I'm just trying to get to town. Slow like, zoom onto his face. Yeah. He's like, what, yeah, do, yeah. what do I do? I, do you remember Don Cheadle in Boogie Nights? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or like, that's the look on his face after all those people get killed in that donut. Yeah, that's, oh, that's, that the, guy's that's face. John's funniest comedy movie yes. moment. <laughs> yes, that's that guy right yes, then with those totally lips. When those white lips are hitting his cheek, that's all these things. His just black like, cheek. Don't forget to call His black it. cheek. Yep, you just like call, little nuclear bombs go back in his eyes. So this is happening, and there's this old woman who's in the audience watching this particularly freaking out, cursing, saying, you fucking N-word lover, you fucking N-word lover, like really laying into it, saying it maybe nine, ten times. <laughs> Who would do that? Yeah. <laughs> you can imagine. And <laughs> Old women have a wrestling match. Something so, well, like, wrestling fans are notoriously insane, too. Right, right, and, right. You know, at Sense, this point, insane, nothing has. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it's not at this point where people kind of know. Incest. I mean, people have an idea that it's staged to an extent, but no one actually really knows that it's fake or whatever. And obviously, this is not even fake. This is not staged. He's spontaneously doing this. He's really kissing him. He's re- Those lips are really hitting that cheek. Right. And it's predetermined by Monroe. So the security is having to deal with this woman. They're saying to her, they're like, lady, you can't swear like this. This is for TV. We're filming this with television, and you're swearing. You can't do this. You can't say fucking. <laughs> you can't say fucking. <laughs> say the N-word all you want. That man. N-word yeah, all you want. Right. Yeah, yeah. We can't talk about fornication. <laughs> uh, so they say to her, they go, if you keep swearing, we're going to have to kick you out. So she's, she just can't stomach it. She just says, you Sputnik. <laughs> Sputnik. Hmm. 
It's the worst thing you could call someone at the time. Yeah. <laughs> right. It wasn't a swear Sputnik word. Sputnik Monroe has a lot better ring to it. it yeah. N-word lover. <laughs> than right, N-word right, lover right. Monroe. Monroe. <laughs> it fits yeah. better on a poster and a t-shirt, mm-hmm. you know. You get That's less my looks. porno title, though. You get porno less porno looks. But it, it's oh. also, it's it's the beginning of, like, you know, the Iron Sheik and stuff like mm-hmm. that. It's just yeah. like, yeah, like, you know. Yeah, you're getting into, into like, the this, racial like, stereotype of uh, well, the yeah. foreign hero. Well, that was the thing, because there was different characters, like the Von Eric. Eric's, Fritz von Erich was like a Nazi type of figure, so it would be the uh, foreign menace. Like that. So he's they, and then you had Ivan Koloff, and you had all these guys who were Russian menaces, and they mm-hmm. were later in the fifties and so. So he was sort of represented everything that was frightful to people. He right. he looked weird. He was dark. He looked scary. He looked like a monster. He had weird blonde bleached hair. He had a foreign name, and he was just mean. He was a mean dude. He would cheat. Mm-hmm. Just cheat Always all the cheat. time. Always cheat. Always cheat. So did yeah. he, after the, he was uh, uh, christened Sputnik Monroe, yeah. did his persona change to match the Sputnik name? Yes. I mean, he really got, I think, less of just a tough guy and more of a real, just huge flamboyant heel. But the- Russian? No, not Russian at okay. all. So you'd still have an American persona. Okay. So it's like the, the challenging thing about this time is a lot of people don't, a lot of people don't realize, I didn't really realize it too, is that wrestling does go through a lot of ups and downs and popularity waxes and wanes. And this was kind of a, actually a downward period in the late 50s because people had sort of gotten really used to seeing on TV with Gorgeous George and everything like that. And they kind of got a little tired of it. Mm. And so he had to kind really? of... in the late 50s? In the late 50s. By like 58, 59, people there, were... There was a lot of wrestling on TV? There was. There had been wrestling local. on TV. There had oh, been shit. like local promotions and stuff. And there wow. was stuff filmed out of Madison Square Garden. And there was things going on like... I had no idea. Yeah. So it was a thing that people obviously knew about. You know, LA had wrestling. San Francisco had wrestling. Chicago had wrestling. Mm-hmm. I, I mean... In Canada. Wrestling... Pro wrestling. Out- out age has is, is older than all of the sports, right? Yeah. right. You know, so there's not like a lot of there's no basketball on TV really back then. There's some yeah. baseball, yeah, yeah, yeah. But you know, there's baseball's a, hard to film even like with the camera technology that they had. Yeah, you, time, three and a half hours of film, and you could, yeah. film's you, expensive. You couldn't see the ball that well. Yeah, right. they didn't or have even, Fox with a little uh, sensor in the ball and a laser <laughs> trail. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, or even like football. Football didn't really look good to watch on TV until I don't know the until 70s, the forward pass. 80s. Yeah, the forward yeah, pass. yeah. So with wrestling, you could kind of light the ring and everything yeah. was contained. Like mm-hmm. boxing was the hugest sport because that was right. obviously really easy right. to film mm-hmm. and do all that. It was stuff good with. on the radio too, and good on the radio, and you can have interesting commentators and everything. And they like allowed that. other races do it, <laughs> yeah, which was right. very important. Yes, yeah. yeah. all of the heroes of the ghetto at that time. You know, yeah. you would come up through boxing. It's mm-hmm. a great way that ethnicities got got integrated into Americana. Yeah. Was to kind of tell who are the people who are going to become upwardly mobile? Who are, the di- who are the disenfranchised? Those are the people that yeah. are winning at boxing. The people who are on their way upwards in society. I think are often, you know, into boxing. And now at that uh, time, was that also happening with wrestling? That people were, there was more minorities. Well, like the only, the people who were into wrestling a lot of times were people who kind of came from shadier backgrounds. It's pretty much mostly white Anglo-Saxon Protestant. The first like black wrestler who was big was Bobo Brazil probably. And he was coming up in around this time and then into the sixties, but he worked forever until like the eighties. You'd see Bobo Brazil doing shows. And Coco Beware. Came. Yeah, and then Coco Beware. So there's Bobo Brazil and Coco Beware. It's da 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 da. No and like another uh, game. So there were, parrot. but yeah, until like the Sheik, there was the original Sheik, which was not the Iron Sheik. There was the original Sheik who was um, Sabu's uncle. Really? Huh. Yeah. So the original Sheik was this guy who would have razor blades on his fingertips. Whoa. And he would cut people and stuff like that. And, you know, and he would just really cut you up, slice you up. Jesus Christ. And the original they Sheik, so he's... They diced us. Yeah. So he was from uh, Michigan. So he trained Sabu and uh-huh. uh, Rob Van Dam. Sabu and Rob Van Dam trained together. What? So they're from... Yeah, RVD? Yeah. They're from um, <laughs> Battle Creek, Michigan, where Kellogg's is made. Mm. Yeah. So he's Kellogg's primarily... another eccentric guy. Yeah. What a random place yeah. for the Sheik to come very to. Yeah. Weird. No, Michigan. Well, actually, there's a Well, Dearborn, big, Michigan is the Dearborn biggest Muslim, Muslim community in the Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, shit. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So this time he's like working out of Memphis and Memphis is a weird city because so it's like, you know, northwest Tennessee and it's like the biggest black population in uh, Tennessee. Most of the people live in Memphis. And like I had this assumption I've been there. I don't know if you guys have been to Memphis. Walking in Memphis. Walking in Memphis. <laughs> I have not. I've been to Nashville, but not Memphis. I've not been yeah, to anywhere. I, I went there and I went to Terry Lawler's restaurant and everything. And Memphis. King? Oh, King? Yeah. What's it called? Kings. It's kind of like Jerry Lawler's restaurant what? or something. It's like really, and they have like wrestling memorabilia, all whatever. Like Andy Kaufman. 
yeah. serving because he's not dead. <laughs> what? It's a fake. Well, that's where Andy Cobham, you, you mentioned like the, the plant yeah. in the audience. Mm-hmm. Andy Cobham's a big wrestling fan. Mm-hmm. And he got that, that he would do that yeah. in comedy. We not uh, Of course, he did the whole wrestling stuff where he'd wrestle women. Yeah, yeah. But he would do stuff where he would like, he'd interact with the crowd and have a fight with somebody in the crowd. But it was all, it was Bob's Muda. He would have a plant in the crowd and he would kind of like, fuck with the audience to, to, to make them it's question weird. if it was real or not. Even today, people don't recognize Bob Samuda. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, it's a weird, because, uh, yeah, Andy Kaufman grew up a huge wrestling fan, so he was watching it in the 50s mm-hmm. when it was really big and everything. He was learning a lot of, like, comedy psychology or group psychology, yes. audience right. control. How do you control an audience and everything like that? So, uh, you know, Memphis was this hotbed of wrestling. It always had a long wrestling tradition, but the city was obviously segregated, and Beale Street today is like a tourist area. Back in the late 50s, it was a blacks-only area. Mm. White people were not allowed to go there. Just huh. the whole neighborhood was segregated, and uh, all of the bars there were called Negro Cafes. And uh, so at this time, you know, Sputnik is, he's a popular, he's a publicity hound. He's really a publicity whore. It's the reason why he's so into this like crazy dressing and everything like that. He needs to get attention on himself because that's the only way that you draw a crowd and he needs to sort of revitalize this on his own because it's in a downward thing. So he thinks, I'm going to go out, a purple suit, mm-hmm. a felt hat, diamond tip cane. I'm going to go down to Beale Street and all these I Negro can't cafes. I be out of him. And I'm going to go and drink with all these people because he's like, I'm an American. He's like, I'm an American. I can go anywhere I want. I'm white. I can do whatever I want. No, no. He's like, I'm an American. I can go anywhere I want. <laughs> well, so Sam, he, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> that, Try being one of those black guys and going to another place. Yeah, yeah. 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 So he goes down yeah. and he gets arrested. He got arrested by the cops for, for a white guy being... Yes. Oh. He would get arrested for drinking in black bars. And uh, so he would get arrested for hanging out on Beale Street and they would charge him with vagrancy and mopery. Mopery? Ah, uh, Mopery. Uh, mopery. yes, like our... <laughs> yes, well, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. the meaning yeah. has Toro changed Samurai. slightly, yes. Mopery, uh, yeah, it comes back around. So this was like a term that was used by like Jim Crow uh, cops in the South, you know, around this time, this era. Right. So it originally, <laughs> like, to he's not, mope He's not smiling around. over there. Please, yeah. what, what is the legal definition so of mopery? So to mope originally meant to wander <laughs> aimlessly. <laughs> to and then right, it would be like well. used with other charges to like build up your case. So it means like law Loitering while walking, walking yeah. on the street without loitering, a clear destination. Lo- loitering while walking. And, and loitering while walking, which yeah. is to walk with just, no clear destination. There, there's just it, there's just cops for speak purpose. for yeah. we don't like you, we're gonna pick you up. And yeah. vagrancy right. is one. Yeah. Nobody with a fucking diamond tipped cane is a vagrant. No, <laughs> yeah, you know yeah, I mean? yeah, like, yeah. Or not. aimless. Right. Are you yeah. aimless if you have a diamond tipped cane? He was cane? probably the first white guy charged with vagrancy and mopery in, in Memphis. Probably. Ever, right. Very likely. They also did that with a lot of uh, union folks. Mm, yeah. Right. Yeah. Hey, yeah. you're hanging out. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. No, we're protesting. Yeah. Uh, no, we're it's like kind of. It's kind of. You look like a bunch of mopes. <laughs> they look like they might do well, something. Excuse me, we're exercising our first vote. You're a mope. <laughs> you're a mope. That's all you're ever gonna be. So, like in the movie Revenge of the Nerds, they actually define it as exposing oneself to a blind person. Wow. Um, when did what? Moping. Mopery. Yeah, there's a lot Exposing of things. Exposing that... oneself to a blind person. <laughs> That's what they call it. They have a panty raid in there. But yeah, yeah but they in also the 60s, have a rape scene. It only, it only yeah. became kind of like significant and mopery as a charge because they would apply it in like uh, the 60s in cases for hippies. So right. if like hippies were on a street corner and the cops just wanted to bust them, they would be like, oh, you're a vandal, you're a vagrant, you're moping. Yeah. Moping around. Moping around. Yeah, you smoked a little piece of joint. Mm-hmm. Now you're going to jail. A piece yeah. of joint. A piece of dope. Yeah. A stick a of hash. With you. I, I mean, got a toy stick. <laughs> I got a toy stick and I got arrested. The term beatnik actually is uh, comes related from to beating a guy named Nick. No, no, no. It comes from the Beats yeah. and Sputnik. Mm. Really? Because Wait, they had no. heavy left communist leaning, quote unquote. No fucking way. I yeah. know that. For real? Yes. You've been yes, saving that way. this whole time. Aaron, that's good stuff, buddy. Thank you. Oh, my that's God. That's a good nugget. <laughs> Thanks. That's a good little nugget. That's a very good nugget. I love good nuggets. Now shut up and let her tell the story. <laughs> no, we're talking. To, it's good. It's coming out. So the thing that he did that was also really significant to fight these charges. So it's only like it's only a twenty five dollar charge. But what he does that's really significant is he brings a black lawyer to represent him in court. 
Oh. Same guy that drove the Cadillac. Yeah, same <laughs> this guy. guy is just climbed his way up. Yeah, yeah. He's just getting that. Got it. He passed the bar exam. He was on his way to law school. He... <laughs> well, he was. Well, well, Sputnik was getting gas. He was taking the the bar exam and he's doing it all. But uh, so he was the first white man to be represented by a black attorney in Memphis court. So he would have this black lawyer. He would pay the charge, and then he would just go right back to doing the exact same thing. Wow. So he got arrested about six or seven times for doing this. Does he ever say why he, uh, specifically he had a black lawyer? Was it just... He said to was just to prove that. Uh, he's like, I got a black lawyer and went to t- court. I told them this was the United States of America and I could go wherever I pleased. He just felt that black people were as good Useful as any white Useful for promotion. <laughs> no, no. I mean, it no, worked out to on. promote himself. Yeah. I Promoting think to who? And we're talking about him now. Well, like fucking fifty something years later. Exactly, it worked. I think he was using. No, you don't. No, I don't. No. I don't know. That is, it's genuinely something that was a conflict for me because I'm like, is he doing this for publicity or is he really doing this? Because there's no benefit. There's no benefit. I think he, he felt like an outsider. Yeah. I think he felt like a weirdo, and he's like, I want to hang out with weirdos, and I want to hang out with outsiders. But he did get on the front page of the paper because of yes, it. It was it, local it, it wrestler was gets arrested, and they have the picture of him in court with this black lawyer, and it's, hmm. it is... It's, it's primo heel... Heat. It's gathering heat. Yeah. Very interesting. And he, he did use it. But it's also... But and progressive. But he, yeah, there's. But he did it too many times for it to be just be a gimmick because he didn't just do it once. He did it six or seven times. He did it repeatedly. Well, right. sometimes make people repeat themselves. So that's not going to make the news six or seven times. <laughs> right. It's just going to be you know that's just going to be a thing he does. But he was just really saying to the cops, he's like, I will not stop doing right. this. Right. You can arrest me as many times as you want. I'll just pay the fine. I don't care. Bring and it's a black weird. lawyer down, kissing him in the courtroom. Yeah. I'll keep doing it. <laughs> So I looked into them. this. I was like, what is that? What's the money equivalent? So $25.1958 money is 260 bucks today. So it was about $2,000 that he paid out over, over the, course the course of this. Of yeah, of getting arrested. Plus, and he was making enough money arrested. from wrestling for that to be nothing? Yeah. He had a diamond tip cane. A diamond yeah, tip yeah, cane. Yeah. Yeah. You, you Cadillac. Just, you just cut off some of the diamond and you hand it over. <laughs> yes, you yeah. make dinosaurs out of the mosquito <laughs> on the inside and you open a park. Dinosaurs. And charge people. <laughs> Wow, I don't know. That sounds pretty yeah. people. Catetician. Can- mm-hmm. Catetician. So the thing, so he was doing this and he's getting a lot of notoriety amongst black fans. But at the time, uh, the way that the the venues were structured, it would be you have white fans sitting <laughs> on, on the On the court. inside. Yeah, structured. Black fans not allowed. No, black fans could go into the crow's nest, quote unquote, which is <laughs> oh, the balcony. Oh, the balcony oh, was called no. the crow's nest. No. Yeah. No, no. There just wasn't like, there was no part of this where they could be like, well, what if we weren't racist for this part? <laughs> yeah. This is racist from top to bottom. Yeah. The only not racist well, part of this story game. is where we talk about a plane crash. Because um, <laughs> <laughs> planes so will kill all, yeah, regardless of race. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> Ra- planes, no, no, Kyle. <laughs> they will kill you dead. The only color they know is black, that black box. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah, the black box. Oh. Yeah. So <laughs> you have the the Ellis Auditorium is this auditorium that mostly wrestle out of, and it's like a 10,000 seat auditorium. A what? 10,000 seat auditorium is the Ellis Auditorium, which was the biggest one where they did wrestling shows, mostly Mondays. Mondays have always traditionally Monday been. Monday Raw, dude. Yes. Yeah. Mondays have always Raw traditionally. Is war. Raw is war. Pound it. <laughs> we <laughs> just, it fit, Aaron and I just fist bumped. <laughs> Yeah, they just fisted each other. It was really sweet. But Monday has always been a traditional wrestling day, no matter what. So basically this is happening. Um, Black fans are only allowed in the balcony seats. White fans have all the floor seats. But what started happening with Sputnik's shows is the floor is half empty. The balcony is crowded. Packed. Packed, packed, packed. So basically what he started doing... So he, they started noticing, okay, the balconies are all packed out to the extent that he would go to the door guy and he would pay them off. And he would say, don't give your boss the count for the balcony. Give him enough money. He'd be like, tell them it's whatever it is, 30 people. Say there's 30 seats in the balcony. He'd be like, when your boss asks you for what the count is, tell them there's 30 in the balcony, no matter how many people show up for the balcony. And he'd be like, okay. So then uh, the boss would say, what's the count? He'd say 30 or whatever. But then but there's like hundred. hundreds, hundreds and hundreds of black people would be streaming to come to these seats, and they'd only have 30 seats. So they'd say, we have to let them sit on the floor. Right. Because they would have turned them down normally, but they're like, they all paid for tickets, so they would be demanding refunds. They're like, so we don't have to refund all these people. We'll let them sit on the floor. Right, right. Mm-hmm. And so he did this over and over again to the point that, and if a promoter tried to stick it to him and say, no, you can't do this. I don't care. I'll turn my way. He would say, I won't perform. Right. 
So he started wow. refusing to perform unless they let the black fans in. Right. So first he was paying off the door guys, and then he was just outright refusing. And so he was selling out this 10,000 seat auditorium all the time. Just like weekly, he would sell this out. And uh, that, in effect, integrated the building because they just had to let black people sit wherever mm-hmm. they want because there's so many of these fans. And so once that happened, once that auditorium, he started working other places and then they had to integrate all of them. And then other sports kind of followed from there. So wrestling got integrated, in the fans at least, the product was still pretty black, white. And then, you know, baseball starts going in that way too. And the weird thing is, so they're getting all these, so they start getting more and more attention, more and more crowds to the point that they can't even contain the amount of fans in a 10,000 seat arena. Uh-huh. They have to go to baseball stadiums uh-huh. to contain these shows. Really? Yeah. yeah. Now, yeah if I scary. remember correctly with baseball, they let women have a league of their own before <laughs> letting black men play together? Right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Hmm. Once the men well, were the at integration. war. Yes. To sell candy bars, you know, necessarily. So, they, so Memphis was just starting to get televised wrestling. So he faced this hometown hero named Billy Wicks. And Billy Wicks is the baby face. He's the good guy. So in the mm. summer of New Year's... Baby night, face, babe, baby face Billy? Baby face Billy Wicks. <laughs> Little baby face Billy. Well, Bob Feist, he's a good boy. No, they call him White Meat Baby Faces. White Meat Baby Faces. White really? Meat Baby Face is your term for your, like, Peck real w- traditional straight down Peck the line. Wood. Good guy. Peck howdy wood. doody. <laughs> you peck a wood, howdy doody looking motherfucker. <laughs> Gotta nod to so many racist impressions in this episode. You're really good so, at it. <laughs> so, in the night of summer 1959, they're wrestling at ballparks. They've 13,000 people come to see them. And there's That's so crazy. many people were turned away at the gates that they broke down the outfield fences. Jesus. Of people of all colors turned away? Yes. So they just didn't have any seats. So they just broke down the outfield fences. So they had 17,000 people at the height of their, their match popularity. So this is like going on for wow. months in 1959. No national media exposure, no international media exposure. People just basically in the Memphis region knew about this, but it was so huge. So their blow-off match had more than 20,000 people there. And then they had Rocky Marciano, who's the heavyweight boxing champ, refereeing the match. Huh. And, which is <laughs> no crazy. Shit. I'm sure yeah. you know the rules really well. I think he yeah, probably yeah. forgot the rules <laughs> by that point. Uh... Yeah. So this was like uh, an attendance record that stood in the city of Memphis until like the Attitude Era. And that's like with international and national media exposure wow. like, all the time. So this this record really stood. And it was crazy. Like he would he would outdraw Elvis at the same venues. No way. <laughs> yeah. Just him? Him doing matches and stuff and him and his programs and or his whatever. Lawyer. And his lawyer. <laughs> I think they came for the lawyer. Which is amazing. So he basically he did all this and he was so huge. And he basically said that he, like nothing was going to stop him from stealing the show. And he's just this crazy, crusty old bastard. And he would introduce himself. He would shake your hand and say, Sputnik Monroe, world's greatest wrestler. So he was really like having a hard time. Well, he was super popular, and man, most of his popularity is obviously around black people who love him as this hero of civil rights. But then, honestly, he said, all I need is the kids and, and and black people. He's like, that's all I need. He's like, because I appeal to all of these colored maids. He's like, the colored maids love me, and they're the ones raising these white children. Huh. So they're telling these white kids about how great I am right. and having them listen to my matches, and that's how I get the youth. Mm-hmm. He's like, so right. as long as get I got kids young. and as long as I got black people, I'll be fine. He's like, I don't have to be mainstream. I don't have to appeal to your regular job. But it is also so forward thinking. It is. Yeah. It's very yeah. It's about like, your niche all, marketing. All of these like white kids are going to be raised by black folks, mm-hmm. and yeah. they're going to be like, they they got me into all this cool shit. Mm-hmm. And one of them is this white dude that they like because. He's into integrating sports. Yeah, and it's it was a- so fucking brilliant. Yeah, that's really good. And it's also just like he's not even really going to see the benefit of it. You know what I mean? Because right. like it's a lot of it's going to take place after he's Twenty gone. Years later, but yeah. it, it is very subversive, and yes. that's my favorite part about this story. Yeah, I love that. That's like he was targeting. He was like really. He had this kind of. I mean, I think he was always attuned to black culture, and he just he saw it. He saw it in Memphis culture. He said these maids are raising these kids for these white people. They're not right. raising their own kids. Most right. middle right. class and upper class kids are being raised by their black maids. And right. he's like, they have a natural affection for black people and who are people who are champions of black people. Yeah. They do have an affection for them. And I'm going to key on that and hone in on it. And he knew where his, he knew who he could appeal to. And he was never going to try to be anything other than what he was. He wasn't going to really compromise and try to be a good guy. He really stuck with this villainous, cheating Anything goes, I'm right, you're wrong, 
I'm the flashiest, strongest man on earth. I'm mm-hmm. 235 pounds of twisted steel and sex appeal. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm the toughest man here. So I think that confidence is really what carried him through. And like, he couldn't beat anybody up. I mean, he carried a gun on him and stuff, but he couldn't like actually Very beat nice. anyone. But he was just this super crusty old guy. And I think he. How old was he at this point being. When you say he was, crusty old no, guy. no, you just he got to be crusty because he wrestled into the 80s. Yeah. <laughs> in yeah, 1980s. Yeah. So his 60s. Yes, yes. He just worked forever. But he always had this really tough, gritty persona. He never really looked like a young man. He's one of those guys who just look prematurely old and uh-huh. crusty. Right. So, like, at a certain point, like, he has all of these black fans and he has all these young fans and he's set the, he set the record for the record attendance in Memphis. And that's really huge. And he even boxed, uh, he, wrestled this boxer named Jersey Joe Walcott. Oh, yeah. Like, yeah. You know that? Yeah. That's a classic uh, old boxer, Jer- Jersey Joe. He's like a, he's one of those guys that with a name like that became like a stereotype of like boxcar boxers. Oh, okay. Ah. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. So he wrestled that guy and he beat him. He wrestled a bear and he was like, oh, what else? Was the bear all chopped up? <laughs> yeah, the bear was <laughs> hey. like, bunch of blow. <laughs> He just did he died that. In like, Kentucky years he later. He, he, he set the record for a high dive into a pool of <laughs> tiny horse piss. <laughs> this bear was all hopped up it. a horse piss and shop. So he was like, what can I do? So this is like 1959. So at the time, there's this Western show on called Bat Masterson, which I've never heard of this before, but I looked it up. So Bat Masterson is this show that's based on a real guy who's this dude who's this gambler and a dandy. And he was a dandy. A dandy. Mm. What's I, a, I've heard of Bat Masterson. You've heard of Bat Masterson? Yeah. I've yeah. heard of I, the cowboy I, stuff. I think of somebody who like whips stuff when I hear Bat Masterson. Well, the thing was this. he would just hit stuff with his cane, which was like a bat. He didn't even uh. need to use a gun, although he was great with a gun. Uh. Oh, is that where <laughs> Batman gets his no gun rule? No. <laughs> I think he gets it from Bob Crane, right? I think that's where he gets it from. <laughs> the guy who made Batman? Well, Bob Kane. But at first he used to kill people. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So it's this show, it's on NBC, so it's based on this gunslinger, and he's supposed to be the lawman of Dodge City, Kansas. So the actor who plays him is named Gene Barry. And this show runs from 1958 to 19. 19- 1961. This is going to make sense, but this is just a weird side fact, which is from 55 to 59, this actor, Mason Allen Dinehart, played a 20-something Bat Masterson in this show that was on ABC called The Life and Legend of Wyatt Earp. So in the year 1959, there was a show on NBC about Bat Masterson, and there was a show on ABC that had the character Bat Masterson. So there was two different actors playing the same character in two different shows on two different networks. Classic Marvel Universe. Yeah, it's just like yeah, it's so fucking weird like that. You're like okay, yeah, but I mean I know I know the name Bat Masterson, but I don't know what it is. Right, I always assumed it was Danny Masterson, (laughs) that rapist Scientologist, (laughs) allegedly, Uh, allegedly, allegedly Allegedly had sex with Nostra. So, so Gene Barry. Well, that I did not hear. Wait, what? Did he <laughs> that's, a, an that's a that's a that's a joke. An ostrich. Uh, but it's slices. a joke about from Letter Kenny, this Canadian TV show. Oh, really? Oh, I'm oh. sorry. It's about Laura Prepon. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. All right. Where okay, were we? Okay. So Gene Barry, the actor, plays Bette Masterson. So yeah. So Spud McEnroe is from Dodge City, Kansas, and this guy is plays on TV the sheriff of Dodge City, Kansas. So Gene Barry, the actor, is going to make an appearance at the Mid South Fair on Rodeo. And 59. So Sputnik plans. He's like, okay, I'm going to go to this rodeo. I'm going to, the guy's going to be on stage making an appearance. I'm going to jump on the stage and punch him in the face. And then I'm going to get on the front page of the newspaper. Wow. That was his like progressive icon, <laughs> Sputnik like, Monroe. He's like, punch, all right. Punch his hero in the face. <laughs> he's like, all right. Alcohol may have been involved in this right. decision making process. He's like, okay, awesome thing. He's like, I'm going to do this. This is great. So he gets to the Mid South Fair and Rodeo. And there's so much security, such a crowd of people, like he can't get to Gene Barry. So while this is so, he's like, oh, my plan's all fucked up. So while this is happening, I guess he says the wrong thing to this cowboy from Paris, Tennessee. So this <laughs> cowboy, this random dude in the crowd, decks him. Between one and nine times, according to reports, this cowboy <laughs> just like beats the shit out of Sputnik, and so Sputnik's in the paper next day, and it's just like local cowboy pummels wrestler. And they just have oh a picture God. of Sputnik all like beaten up with his eye all bloused and screwed oh up God. and bloody or whatever. So Sputnik gives a quote, and he was like, 
yeah, I was going to take my hat off to fight him, and he cold cocked me, and then I slipped in some manure and trying to get up, and, and I he couldn't. Beat me eight more times. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So what he did so with these between these, one and nine. <laughs> one and nine. And <laughs> some people said nine. One people said one. I don't know. <laughs> so the promoters around this time are like, shit. Like, uh, what the fuck do we do? So Roy Welch and his son Buddy Fuller, they run this promotion. So they're like, oh, shit, this looks really bad. Like, our top heel just got the shit beat out of him by some random cowboy. Right. This looks bad. So they go, okay, we're going to we're gonna find the cowboy. We're going to sign him. We're going to offer him $1,500 to meet Sputnik in the ring. Yep. So the cowboy gets the call, and he's like, they're going to murder me. He's like, this is a setup. They're just going to kill me in the ring. And he's like, this can't be real. This has got to be the dude calling me to lure me to somewhere to kill right. me. Right. So he doesn't show up. So Sputnik's there, like so they sold out a ten thousand seat auditorium for this match. Sputnik's there on crutches. And Sputnik's <laughs> yeah, there just like ready to fight him. So what they did is they they got another random wrestler and they go, This guy is from Paris, Tennessee, and he's the he's a friend of the Cowboys. Oh, <laughs> and his Sputnik's yeah, is his friend. And Sputnik situation. Sputnik's gonna fight him and we'll see how that goes. <laughs> So Sputnik obviously like beats the crap out of him and this guy like, you know, so he just gets all his heat back. Yeah, he just gets all his heat back. So it's just like this insane publicity stunt that would just worked and he did things like he's he's ran for sheriff and he ran for sheriff of Memphis and he said that people thought prostitution and incest would flourish. Motherfucker would become a household word. And he said <laughs> Well they're right about pretty much all that. He said, I could have run for mayor and made it. I could have blackmailed the city. I could have done anything I wanted. I was general of a little black army. Wow. He said city officials feared his influence and tried to get him to leave town. Damn. Which is crazy. So, like, so this is all happening. So he kind of tries to maintain his popularity. So in the later part of his career, he had a, excuse me, he had a black tag team partner named Norval Austin. So they, this is like the 60s into the 70s. They were working this together. So after they defeated their white opponent, Monroe would dump a can of black paint on the man and yell into the mic, black is beautiful. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> And then uh, yeah, Austin, and then that. Austin would throw white paint on him and say, "White is beautiful." Uh, and the two, uh, and the two would yell in unison, "Black and white together is beautiful." Uh, that's great. That's gorgeous. Great. That's great. Yes. <laughs> that's good stuff. So, How is this not an Owen true. Wilson Don Cheeto movie? Yeah. I don't know. They're trying to make a movie about for HBO, and it got developed, but it hasn't been made. But so for he, real? Yeah. Uh, yeah. What? So he only retired in 1988. So he had like a 30-year wrestling career. Jesus. So then, in, like, it's crazy because I'm watching this documentary. So it's October 1999. He's in Memphis to shoot a documentary and referee a match. And he's on this local talk show. And he's talking about Sam Phillips, one of the wrestlers there. And he's like, Sam Phillips and I were supermen. We didn't le- leap over tall buildings. We tore them down. And when he says that, you see all these black men in the crowd, young men, cheering him. And, like, he's this cultural icon. It's just amazing. And his boots are in the Rock and Soul Museum in Memphis. Mm. And he's in this Rock and Soul Museum. And it just says, like, his role in integrating Is that a cultural sh- icon. Is that a museum for shoes? <laughs> it's a, yeah, it's a museum it's for shoes. Okay, rock and okay. Soul. Okay. Oh, good God, Aaron. Listen. Good God. I, I was mean, right I to be week. mean to you. All right. <laughs> I was right to be mean to you. So, basically, he just... Black uh, and white are beautiful. Black and white are beautiful right, together. They're beautiful together. So he he just he made this legacy for himself, and he people still in the state of Memphis, the city of Memphis, state of Tennessee, they know who you mean. Like if you were to mention this guy, they would say, "I know who Sputnik grows. He's a cultural icon." He was an legend. N-word lover. <laughs> he was an N-word lover, famously, most famously, an N-word lover. But by 2001, he was just like living in a, a two-bedroom apartment with his wife in Houston, working at a gas station. Married? No shit. Married, yeah. And God he had, bless him. He had three mm. kids. But I mean, yeah, he Little I mean, Sputnik. he wrestled for 30 years, but it's just, you know, he lived a crazy, extravagant lifestyle. So right. he's just working at a gas station, and he died in 2006 living in Florida. Just he had three kids. His son was a wrestler. His brother was one of his managers for a long time. And, I mean, he really, in terms of an ending for a wrestler, dying in... In old age, sure, sure. Yeah. 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 Old age yeah. in Florida yeah. with your family around yeah. you is right. a good way to go it's with your cats and out. your wife. It really is. And yeah, fondly remembered by everyone, still an icon. And now, do you think that there's anybody that, that stole from him directly as far as his like shtick? 
His wrestling. His in terms of his shtick of like loving all people or like was that no 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 shtick? I mean I mean like his like shit talk and stuff like that like oh even, yeah yeah because like if you see like his Ric Flair seems kind of like it the is diamond very much ring. ring I got the gold watch mm. I got the diamond yeah, ring yeah it was all so Ric Flair was obviously he's the Nature Boy so the Nature Boy Buddy Rogers who's before Ric Flair who had the blonde hair and had the robe and Sputnik yeah it was these promos that were like that they're like you think you can get me on you know like chicken shit prices I'm a diamond ring kind of like man like you got to pay out the nose to get me to come down to here and the thing is it's like yeah his promo style his extravagant lifestyle it's obviously like a pimp shit, thing shit he's like yeah he's like you can't get me down here it's like oh what am i wearing like a baseball sneaker carrying a watermelon what do you think i am you know like he's just like you come, he's like you expect me to come down here on a greyhound bus send me out in a cadillac he's like you know kind I'll of pick thing. up some black guy to drive me here yeah i'll give him kisses that's the, the main thing that we remember from the story is that he kissed a black guy <laughs> it's transgressive <laughs> <laughs> it's very transgressive and progressive. But yeah, it's a funny thing because it's like, I think a lot of people did pick up on that style of promo. This is like 10 years before um, Cassius Clay, Muhammad Ali, all that kind of thing. And Muhammad Ali mm. mentions that he watched wrestling as a kid. Uh, I mean, uh, uh-huh. you know, like uh, Mike Tyson, huge wrestling fan. Mm-hmm. Andy Kaufman, huge wrestling fan. And this was really in the cultural landscape of, I mean, there was the white hipster. There's always the white hipster in jazz, you know, the jazz fan. Mm-hmm. But White people didn't really co-opt black style in the 50s. That was not a thing that white people pretending to be black people were acting like they were quote unquote black. That was not really a thing that people did. No, until right. the beats. Until the beats. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Norman Mailer wrote, I think, a. Uh, the white uh, hipster. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, uh, but, but also Muhammad Ali said specifically the reason I started talking shit is that wrestling. I saw gorgeous wrestlers, yes. wrestlers do it and then the fucking place was filled. And, and I've always and, thought that wrestling is like the. It may, like stand up is is another version of it, but wrestling is like the training ground if you want to be a star who's good at everything. Yeah, yeah. the biggest stars yeah. in the world come out of wrestling right. because it's it's acting, it's mic skills, it's mm-hmm. improv, it's physicality, it's a nonstop grind every right. day of the yeah. year on the road. And you, you get live good that at character. taking drugs. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. You live that character, and you need to know how to embody that character and continue it all the time. And there's a thing where now it's like. Wrestlers don't really live that gimmick 24-7. Some of them do to the point where, like, Bray Wyatt, who's a current wrestler, he, even in a court case, was in character as Bray Wyatt. The character didn't appear, testi- didn't testify as himself. Yeah. Where, like, the Wild Samoans got pulled over with Hulk Hogan, and they pretended to not speak English to the cop because they were Wild Samoans who couldn't speak English. And they well, got yeah, arrested the because they wouldn't answer together. the cop's too questions. Wild. Too. They wouldn't answer they're the cop's questions, and he wild. just took him into custody. Like, yeah. they would yeah. really keep Sorry, it. brother, they're, they're wild men. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're wild but, Samoans, but it whatever. Is, it's like, it is like, you know, the corner of, like, you know, subculture that's, like, where all of, like, you know, horror movies and comic books and everything is, like, you know, it really, like, is, like, you're, like, pushing, like, your, like, darkest, weirdest things when you're, like, doing shit in wrestling. So yeah. it's it's weird. It's, like, weirdly, like, normal to me that, like desegregation started there first because it was like Mm. also the place where people would go and be super racist yeah because it was like on its face yes it was just like right you know what i mean it's ring psychology is what is going to draw the biggest hatred out of you like in smoky mountain wrestling it's funny because jim Cornette talks about him so smoky mountain wrestling they had new jack and they had him with the gangsta so him and his tag team partner they instituted an affirmative action policy that they would say that they could pin someone with a two count because of affirmative <laughs> yes, action. Yes, yes, exactly. Yeah, they were totally yeah. playing that up. So it's people good. would Brilliant. lose their Brilliant. minds yeah. right. and like uh, just be so angry at this. And like the more you treat something like this that is real, the more genuine emotions it brings out of people, and the mm. more really people you try this. But the most thing that I thought was really interesting about this story was it's kind of that changed my mind about it was like when we talk about desegregation and integration and everything. There's always a sense that. People think that white people were allowed to go wherever they wanted. And they think that segregation was only a thing that was meant to corral blacks and correct their behavior. But segregation really was for white people as well, to keep them from relating to black people, to keep them from having sympathy for black mm-hmm. people, right. to keep them from understanding them. Seeing create, them as people, period. Seeing them as people to create a cultural divide, to have a sort of uh, lack of familiarity, because God forbid you have poor poor people united Realizing together. Realizing that they have more in common than they do. <laughs> right. No, yes. you, you, have to, you have to be afraid of these people. 
Yeah, they're and, not and, like and you. And if you go over there and find out you don't need to be, right. that's going to be problematic right. for us. Yeah, mm-hmm. and that's yeah. what he did. It was He just said, you know, we're all people. We're all people who want to see a good story, see a good match, see a good fight, see someone work their ass off in the ring. So I mean, We all want to see somebody get their yeah. ass beaten in the ring. <laughs> yeah. We all yeah. do. Yeah. At the end of the day. Right. Well, okay. Whoever they, whoever they are. Yeah. yeah. They Black, bleed red. white, Russian. <laughs> I want them. Yeah. I want them to get fucked up. <laughs> That's what I want. <sighs> yeah. So I think it's a good lesson about paint I think black, how white. segregation ruled to create everyone's behavior because it's and it's a weird thing about when you talk about that guy kissing him on the cheek because I was looking at integration laws and everything. There's been times in this country where segregation was not legally mandated, where the races could mix together, except in the case of marriage. Even from colonial times, the 13 colonies, marriage between black people and white people always outlawed. Mm -hmm. Or white people and Native Americans. So Mm -hmm. any sort of socializing on that level was always verboten until like Mm -hmm. the 60s. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, Loving Virginia. Yeah, Mm -hmm. Loving versus Virginia. They made a movie out of that. They did. But there was even laws against marrying like Filipinos in Oklahoma and weird shit like that. Because you know all those Filipinos in Oklahoma. It's it's a hot bit. La la la. It's like, ah, scorch. So that was... She can't marry Dave. (laughs) (laughs) So that was what I wanted to talk about with Sputnik. He's a cultural icon. He's hilarious. He's He's funny. He's violent. He's a weird guy. He looks crazy. That's yeah. Honestly, why I thought he would be awesome to talk about. He's a hero. He's a heroic weirdo. Yes. Yes. He is. Yes. A he heroic is. And a heel. And a heel. It is. It is guy. great to also be uh, a hero while being a heel. It's the best. Yeah. It is. It is really great. Yeah. And they asked him. Anti heroes are the best. Yeah. I think we can all agree. They are. They said they asked him. He was asked by a reporter, "Do you feel like a do gooder?" And he said, "Oh hell no! I'm not a do gooder. I'm a doer. Just a doer." Ah. Oh, hell no. <laughs> oh, hell no. Good? <laughs> I'm going to be arrested tonight. $25. I'm nasty. Take this cane. I'll buy your face. <laughs> I mean, that's Twisted like, steel. That's what I was Twisted like, steel and sex appeal. The guy with like an, enough money, guy. it's like, what the fuck is 25 bucks? Oh, I'm going to, so this is a show. <laughs> this is right. a show for you? Yeah. Well, then I'm going to make it a fucking show because yeah. I don't give, this money doesn't mean anything right. to me. Right. Right. So no. you want to see some shit here. Right. But, it's, but it's the same. I mean, you look at the case like Mississippi Birdie, like civil rights people did get murdered. Yeah. People got straight up murdered. And he had a gun on them. And all wrestlers pretty much carried guns until like the 70s or 80s. But like, right. yeah, people, white people did get murdered for acting this way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Until the 60s. I think some so, black people might have got killed too. Yes, you know? they did as well. Yeah, but <laughs> I've even, heard about it. I don't know if it's no, true but or rumor or hearsay. Like I was looking at, it's funny because it's like even people who are considered like progressive at this time didn't take these stands and everything. I mean, like white liberals have said, like Harold Ickes, who is like, um, he was Secretary of the Interior under Roosevelt. He was the president of the chapter of the NAACP. He never met a black guy in his life. No, no, he had met plenty of them. But uh, there was a senator from North Carolina who wrote him a letter and he said, you're trying to undermine segregation. And Harold Ickes wrote him a letter back. And this is public. He just goes, he's like, I have never in my life put any effort into undermining segregation. He's like, I've never fought against it. He goes, I would like to see the black man get his due, but I think that will happen when they advance themselves in education and commerce economically he's like i have never tried to undo segregation i never well there's a large like con- there was a large population of, <laughs> of, of black people who didn't want segregation like all those traditionally black colleges you had a lot of people who don't rock the boat yeah did, a lot of were um, doing well in that system the negro leagues well, the baseball yeah, I mean, negro leagues, they were ha- they were made millionaires well some of the idea was we know how to take care of ourselves yes. we don't want you meddling right yeah we talked about the essential mm-hmm. page episode yeah. Yes. for sure yeah, yeah there was a thing it was like okay now Yes. You're going to get taken in by white business, and right. we're all going to be fucked. Right. Right. Yeah. right. The moment you tell us how to teach our children is the moment that you're interrupting how right. we're teaching them. But right. I think there was also a sense for white people that this is intractable. This is not a this is not a fight worth having, that the South will always be like this, right. and we cannot interfere in these states' issues, because this is just how they are, and this is right. how they will be forever. And we can try to advance the black man, but we have to advance him in this way, and this way, and this way. That's within the system. Right. Mm-hmm. There was so many white liberals at this time who would be sort of proponents of the, the black people. They would say that they cared. Like Eleanor Roosevelt, what did she ever do for segregation? She claimed that she was for human rights and worldwide and would right. fighting for rights and whatever. They, they took it they as didn't a given, anything. as a constant. Yeah, yeah, they were like, segregation is intractable. And this is just one man who had barely any education who says, no, it's not intractable. It's not because I decide it's not. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah, yeah. we're, we're going to mix it up. I'm gonna yeah, walk he down just there. decides this the we're way that it has chop, been chop it up. is not the way that it needs to be. Why does this need to continue this yes. way? And he, he, right. I mean, here's a guy who's actually in the middle of it, mm. yeah. who's actually living it day to day, going, well... 
I'm just going to do this. And yeah. But I think it is also because it is a subculture. And this is like my thing is that because mm-hmm. I, I love subcultures and stuff like that and mm. you know subhuman count- I love no but I, I, I think subcultures I, are where subculture comes from and and countercultures mm-hmm. too like, yeah like, yes. like um, you know when all the shit was going on in Northern Ireland all of the fucking punk bands that were out of Northern Ireland were half Protestant half Catholic yep they mm-hmm. were totally not involved yeah. with all of the conflict bullshit that was going on they were totally like we're not doing that we're right. doing this instead we're doing art because there is yeah, because mainstream culture is almost um, a burden. Yes. With all of the rules that it has, like segregation yeah. or whether it's a high society or whatever, there's so much snob. There's so much snobbery and and circumstance and pomp and circumstance involved that it becomes a job in and of itself. Right. And it's the people in the lower classes who have. Um, they don't have time for that shit. They're mm-hmm. just trying to survive. Mm-hmm. So it was right. it was always, even if it was like the American Revolution, it was the lower classes, black, white, Irish, Italian, all of them were all just, not Italian yet, but they were all just mixing it up because they didn't have the luxury of choice ca- ca- caring about that shit. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, they also right. exist outside the economic system because, you know, like the super rich and the very poor don't really use cash very much. Really right. super poor people usually barter with each other mm-hmm. for mm-hmm. things, and the yeah. super rich kind of get things on credit. So for Sputnik, he was already, I mean, by the virtue of being a wrestler, it's kind of like being an actor or something. You exist outside the social structure because he drives from place to place. Mm-hmm. He lives off of his wits. He lives off of his body. Yeah. He has a job that he got himself. It's not because he's part of a social club. It's not because of who his dad is. It's not right. because mm-hmm. of the church that he goes to. He built his career on his own. And I think he's sort of forward thinking that America was very still used to you're an elk, you're a mason, you're part right. of a union, right. your dad did this, yeah. your father Even did that. Even in wrestling, your dad did this. Even in wrestling, mm-hmm. yeah. And mm-hmm. he's very forward thinking that he's like, I'm going to choose my own profession, I'm going to choose my own destiny, I'm going to choose to hang out with the people that I want to. Yeah. And he already existed outside of mainstream society, and he's like, this is bullshit, I'm not going to keep up white, traditional, suburban, yeah. parenthood, fatherhood, masculinity, whatever that is, whiteness, I'm going to do whatever I want. I'm going to kiss random black fellas that pick up on I'm going to wear a purple Why suit not? and a Homburg and kiss this black guy and go drink at a bar and probably have sex with black women. They don't get that into that, but I imagine it happens. So, Essentially, of course. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yes. All right. I think we're, think, <laughs> think we're going to kick it there. Of course. On, on yes. Consensually, yes. of course. Uh, <laughs> good night, everybody. My name is John Bay. I love you. I'm Aaron Pita. I, I care about all of you. Thank you for listening, Laura Crawford.